Welcome to the third Java review session for my MIST 4630 class at the University of Georgia. The objectives of this review session are to learn how to create a simple Java program with multiple classes and to review even some more basic Java concepts. As in our last couple of Java review sessions, we're going to create a Java program that calculates a simple average of a list of numbers. And as before, we cannot do this unless we know how to solve the problem of getting an average of a list of numbers. So let's think before programming and review the steps of getting an average. First, we need to get the list of numbers. Once we have that list, we could then add the numbers to get a sum. Sum of this set is 35. The third step is to count the numbers to get the count. As you can see, the count here is 7. Once we have the sum and the count, we can then divide the sum by the count to get the average. And finally, we're going to want to output the results somewhere in our case, to the console window. For this example, we will once again create a simple Java program that calculates the average of a list of numbers. This time, however, we will create multiple classes to carry out the work. In fact, we will create two classes. We will create one class called Averager that will calculate the average, and then we'll create another class called controller, which will include the main method to get things started. Notice in Eclipse that I have already created a new project. I called it Average 3. In my source folder, I created a package called my stat classes. I'll begin from here. First, I want to create the Averager class. So I will right click on my stat classes, select new class from the list, Notice whether it's in the right place. Give it a name. I said I will call it Averager. This should be public. We want another class to use it. Superclass is correct. This one I do not want to include a main. Everything looks good. I can hit Finish. Notice it did not give me much. It did give me the very first line package, which means it's in the package My Stat Classes and the class name. We've already thought before programming, so we know the steps that we want to have to do an average. While we have talked about the concept of a Java class in previous review sessions, let's think more about it here. A class is a general template that a set of objects that we will use in our program will follow. Classes have various characteristics. Classes have fields, also called instance variables. These describe the data values that a specific object will hold. Classes also exhibit behavior through methods. Methods are small bits of program logic that describe what an object can do. When we create a Java class, we use the general syntax public class, class name, and then curly braces. Inside the curly braces is where we put all the code that defines the fields and methods for our class. When a Java program runs, classes will be used to create objects. The class is a general template for each object. So objects are created based on the classes that we write when we're writing a program. Objects have instance variables that hold the values that describe the state of the object. By this we mean whatever the current values of the instance variables are describe the state of being for that object at any point in time. Objects also have methods that allow an object to perform tasks. We want to create in this Averager class the instance variables that will store the state of Averager at any one time and the methods that will do the work of Averager. I generally like to start with the instance variables. 
It's a good practice with instance variables to only include variables that can fully describe the state of the class and no more. For instance, in this case, all we really need is the list of numbers to describe the state of the class. Anything else, including the sum, the count, and the average, could be derived by just running one of the methods. The variables that we create to describe the state of an object at any point in time are called instance variables. It might be obvious to you that they're instance variables because they're the variables that describe the state of a particular instance of the class. You can have multiple instances of any class in your program. They're also sometimes called fields. A few best practices when working with instance variables. You should declare instance variables at the top of the class. You should also declare instance variables as private. This is in order to encapsulate the state of the object. So what do we mean by encapsulation? Encapsulation is also called information hiding. By performing encapsulation, we can allow access to our instance variables only through methods that we create. Thus, as the creators of the class, we can control how the instance variable values are obtained, accessed, or modified. To implement encapsulation, we generally need to create instance variables that are private and use getter and setter methods that we will make public. Why? Well, this allows creator of the class to control how the users of the object are able to change or read the state of the object. It also provides a standard format for interfacing with objects so that others can use the object in a well-known manner and also software that generates code can do it in the standard format. So in this case my only field or instance variable is going to be an integer array called numbers. We need three types of methods here. One or more constructors, some getters and setters, we only have one instance variable that is an array, so it might be nice to have a couple types of getters and setters. And then we're going to have what you might call custom methods, those methods that are required for our particular class. A constructor is a special method that is called to instantiate an object. Every class has a constructor, either explicit or by default. Either you're going to write your own one or more constructors, or if you leave constructors out, it will inherit one from the Java class object. The name of the constructor should be the same exactly as the class name, including capitalization. You can have multiple constructors in a class as long as each constructor has a different set of parameters. This concept is called overloading. While we always inherit a constructor from the object, I think it's a good practice to generally always explicitly write the instructor, even if it is just the default. In our case, we're going to make two constructors. We're actually going to overload our Averager class with two constructors. Constructor is public by default, so we do not need to have the modifier. In fact, all we really have to do for the constructor is have the name of the class followed by zero or more parameters and then code for the constructor. Let's have a default averager and let instantiate our numbers array. This will be new int and let's make it seven by default. If we do nothing else, the new int will have seven spaces and they will all be zero. This is by design. We chose seven arbitrarily. We could have chose 10, 100, whatever size we want the array to be. Let's think about the concept of overloading. Sometimes we want to allow a particular behavior to be completed in several different ways. We can do this by having multiple methods with the same name. Methods can be overloaded as long as each of the methods with the same name has a different list of parameters. Actually, what's really important is that the list of data types is different. 
let's give them also the choice to go ahead and pass in an array of numbers. This time, let's make the Averager constructor. Let's say int numbers. We're going to say there's a parameter. Notice this int number is a different color than the numbers used before. In fact, a better way to write the previous one would be to put this dot numbers. This is a key word that always refers to the class. Not necessary in the first constructor, but in this second one it's important because we would like to be able to set our numbers array equal to the numbers array that's been passed in. So we want to set the instance variable called numbers equal to the local parameter variable called numbers. I could think of a couple other ways to write a constructor for this one, but I'll stop here. Notice we've done two things and explored a couple concepts. We've created a constructor, or two. We have overloaded the constructor. Two methods with the exact same name, but different list of parameter data types. And maybe you have learned or seen for the first time the keyword this. It refers to the current object that we are working with at the class level. Uh, getters and setters. We mentioned getters and setters. These are fairly standard types of methods for accessing the instance variables. A getter, also called an accessor method, lets another object retrieve an instance variable value. So if I'm working from another object, I have a handle on an instance of this object, I can use a getter to look at whatever the value is of a particular instance variable. A setter is the opposite. A setter, also called a modifier, lets another object change an instance variable value of the current object. The standard syntax for a getter is public. Recall that the method needs to be public so that some other object can access the getter. The data type should be the same data type as the instance variable. The name of the getter method usually starts with the word get and then followed by the name of the field that we want to get. Inside the method, in addition to other code that we may want, generally the final line is a return statement that returns the field that access was requested for. For setters, the standard syntax is public also. Instead of a data type, we have void, which means that no data value is returned. Remember, a setter will modify the variable, not request to access it. We use the word set followed by the name of the field that we're going to modify. In parentheses, we need to provide as an argument the value that's going to set this field. So we have the data type, which should be the same as the field data type, and then the value or the variable that will hold the value within our method. We may have other code within the setter, but we'll generally always end up with a line that includes this, the name of the field, equal to the value of the parameter, or an expression that is derived from the value of the parameter. We have one instance variable, so we'd like to have at least a getter and setter for that. If someone chooses the default constructor, we may need to use a getter. So let's call this public int, remember the getter, allow somebody to have access to our instance variable, so it needs to have a data return type. Get numbers. Generally no parameters. And then you'll notice there's an error. It says it must return a result of type int. This is an error message, but it's not because we have created an error, we just have not completed what we need to do yet. So let's type the return statement. Take that error message as more of a reminder. Return this dot numbers would be the simplest getter we can have. What if we wanted to set our list of numbers based on an array that is passed in through a setter? We might do something 
So just this. What if we had an individual number we wanted to put in a particular index? We could have, or we wanted to get a number at a particular index. We could have a getter where we return an int. We call it get number. Somebody hands us the index that we want to get. And then we're going to return from our numbers array position the value at the position of index. Similarly, we might want to be able to set an individual number. In this case, we would need to have the number itself. It's an array of integers. And we would need to know where it's going to be placed. And for our array, at the index we want it to be, we'll set that equal to number. So what have we done so far? We can create an average or class. We can set an array and get the array anytime we want. We ask for it. We can set an individual number. And we can get an individual number anytime we want it. What else do we need to do? Well, we need to add, we need to count, and we need to take an average. To create a method, we use the general syntax access modifier. This is either public or private. Most of ours will be public, but occasionally we might want a private method, followed by the return type, which is going to be the type of the value returned, unless, of course, we do not want to return anything, in which case we will put void as the return type. The name of the method, which should be camel case like that shown here, but logically consistent with what the method does, then a list of parameters the data type followed by the parameter name. You can think of the parameters as the inputs to the method, the things it will start with in order to do its work. Inside the curly braces for the method, we'll write code that will do the work of the method. If the return type is anything but void, we will need to include, and usually towards the end of our method, a return statement, followed by some expression that calculates the value that we're going to return. So let's create our add method. Much like we had before, we'll do public. This should return the sum, which should be an int. We'll call it get sum. It has no parameters as it will be summing up the values in our current array. Let's create a variable called int sum instantiate that to zero and just because I like to get rid of the red error message we're going to return sum when it's over. Here we're going to put our familiar for loop for the index starting at zero continuing as long as it's less than the length of the array and incrementing each time we'll then simply add to what sum was the current value at position So now anytime we want, if I have a handle on an object that is an averager, I can calculate the sum. What about the count? It's also an int, get count. 
very simple. The count is the same as the length of the array. A couple of errors here I can clear up real quick. Finally, we need to calculate an average. Well, average can be calculated based on the sum divided by the count. Public. This time it will return a double. Get average. Return this dot get sum divided by this dot get count. Let's include, for convenience, a two-string method. One interesting method is called the two-string. The two-string method is often used to get a string with the current state of an object. All objects inherit a two-string method from the object class, and since every Java class is a descendant of the object class, it will immediately have all the methods from the object class. So regardless of whether you write your own two-string method, your class will have one by default. You can write your own two-string methods, and this will override the inherited method. So what do we mean by inheritance? Inheritance helps us create an overall category of objects where at times we might want to have subcategories. One common example used is let's think of a category or a class called shape that has a draw method, among others. You might want to have subclasses that are also shapes, like a square, circle, triangle, etc. These could inherit many characteristics from shape but they can implement some of their own characteristics as well, such as they might even implement the draw method differently than the draw method of shape. So inheritance allows us to make this type of relationship where we have one category and then we have some subcategories that have an is-a relationship with the parent class. Classes are, that are to be inherited from are called the parent classes and those classes that will inherit are called child classes. You implement inheritance to make a child class by using the keyword extends in the class signature line. For example, public class child class extends the parent class name. Child classes will inherit most of the fields and methods of the parent class. What does it mean to override a method? When we have inheritance, we might inherit methods from parent objects, but sometimes we want the child to implement the method differently. For example, with shape class as the parent and circle and triangle as child classes. We can override the inherited method by simply writing a method of the same name in the child class. Incidentally, it also has to have the same parameters. When the method of the child class is called, the child's method will be used rather than the inherited method of the parent class. So we're going to basically override the two-string method that is provided by the Java object class. This is public, returns a string, and it's called toString. And here, in general, you usually have some string that will give the uh, current state of the object. In this case, I prefer to make this one a custom-made toString that will tell me the, the sum, the count, and the average. So let's create a string called msg for message. And we're eventually going to return message. I like to make these with concatenation and using uh, carriage return characters. Let's say that the sum is equal to plus this dot get sum plus slash n 
to get a carriage return. And to make this a little bit quicker, let's copy and paste. Should be count. This dot get count. This dot get average. And make that average. So we've created a class called Averager that has all the different parts that will let me create an average as long as it has a list of numbers. Notice this class does not have a main method. So if I hit run in Eclipse, it will not know where to start and this program will not run. I need a main method somewhere, but I don't want to put it in here because the purpose of this review is to show you how to work with multiple classes. Let's go back to my stat classes, right click and create a new Java class. Let's call this controller, uppercase C. Let's put a main method in this class. Okay, now what do we want to do in this class? At least once we want to get a list of numbers, create an averager object, and give it the list use, use the averager object to get the average. Simple enough. When we declare our objects we use the following syntax. The class name followed by the object name for the instance of the object we're creating. Very much like we do with primitive data types where we use the data type followed by the variable name. This is set equal to the keyword new followed by the class name again and in parentheses a list of arguments. What we're doing here is we're instantiating our object using a constructor. The constructor in use will be the one that fits or corresponds to the list of arguments in the case of multiple constructors. As before, let's create a simple list. We'll call it numbers here as well. Totally different class, so it doesn't matter what we call this variable. It's different than the variables in the average class or object as when it runs. Int numbers equals, let's go with 1, 9, 2, and 8, 3, and 7, and 5. This will give us our 35 again, as before. create an object we use the name of the class along with the name of our particular object. I'll also call this averager. Notice the difference. This one is lowercase while the other is uppercase. Averager equals new calling the constructor and this one I'm going to use the one where we can just hand it the list of numbers. Once we have declared an object, we're going to want to use it and use its methods or access its fields. To use the methods of an object, we use our object name using dot notation, follow it by a dot and the name of the method. And then in parentheses, we'll include any arguments that the method requires in order to do its work. So when this is executed, at this point, we will have an object called lowercase averager. Let's say that we just simply want to call it and say print the value that it's giving us. Can we do that based on the way that we designed it? Averager dot two string. Well, that's pretty simple. Over here in our main controller, we can take any array we want. We can call the Averager class. We can say, hey, Averager, come here. Work with these numbers. 
and then we tell Averager what to do by calling its methods. So the controller is kind of like the boss, saying what, where to get started, what to do, to rally the resources that are needed to get the job done, in this case, an object of our Averager class. Let's pull up our console. Let's right-click, build a project. And then let's run it as a Java application. Notice I have some errors. Looks like the average number came out right, but what about the slash n? Plus, where's the sum and the count for my toString? Let's go look in our Averager class. This particular error is a logic error. The program actually ran, but it gave me incorrect results. So what did I do? If I look at my toString method, start out with message equals no blank. Then I said message equals sum, plus these other things, concatenated those. So I basically replaced blank with this, then equal with that. But really I wanted to add those together. What I failed to do was to concatenate. Okay. The other part of my output that did not look correct was slash in. Slash it is an escape character but I often use the wrong direction slash. In this case, if slash n is part of a string, it will force to go to a new line. So the n stands for new line. Let me clear the console and try that again. Run as, Java application. Oh, that looks much better. Notice sum is 35, count 7, average is 5. Close Averager. Let's try that again with a different array. What if I take out 3 and 7? This should give me a sum of 25, a count of 5, and another average equal to 5. So I'll save that and run as a job application again. Ah, looks like it's working. Notice I could do other things. Let's take my averager and let's set number in position 1, which is the 0 index. Let's set that number to a, an 11. Think about what's going to happen here. If that's an 11, we'll have 20, 22, 30, 35 again. We only have 5, so the average should come out to 7. That's index number 0. So I called a different method of my averager. Let's copy the system outline down here so we can see the difference. Save my changes. I'll run again. Okay, notice I've got two listings. 2555 five, five from the original array, but now I've replaced one of the numbers with 11, and that has changed my sum to 35, 5, count, and average of 7. So you can see that in our main method, which is in one class, we can create an object of another class and then begin to use its methods in just about any way that we need or that we're capable of using that object. Hope you found this Java review session informative and helpful. In this session we thought before programming once again. We reviewed some more basic Java programming concepts. We created a simple Java program that had multiple classes. This has been a Piercy production.